Hi, this is Ms. Clemmy, and welcome to the podcast on the circulatory system. This is one of many podcasts on that system, so today we're just going to focus on blood. But let's really center in, just give you the big picture um, on the circulatory system and what it does. Now, basically, it circulates. It transports things all over your body from all over your body. That's why in this schematic, it's located right in the center of all this stuff. So let's take a look at, for example, your digestive system. In this case, the digestive system produces nutrients that your circulatory system can deliver then to all of your body cells to make ATP and to um, give it energy. It also circulates CO2 and oxygen from your lungs. It drops off oxygen at your body cells and picks up a waste product, CO2, that they produce. Then before it gets goes back to the heart, it stops at the kidneys. It drops off additional waste that eventually forms urine. And so then that blood is nice and clean, and it can start all over again. So that's a general description of the circulatory system, but we haven't always had one. So let's look at this unicellular bacteria on the left. Now this bacteria, it needs oxygen and proteins in the form of amino acids and carbohydrates. It produces waste, such as CO2 and NH3. But the good thing about these cells is that they are unicellular. They can diffuse everything because every part of their body is in touch with the external environment. Fast forward to this guy, a multicellular organism, and the problem with them, they still need to do the same things, but these inner cells aren't in contact with the outer environment. They can't simply rely on diffusion to do these same tasks so they've developed a circulatory system to do that for them. And so what actually is in circulation? Now you're probably familiar with some of these things, so we'll start with the ones you're familiar with, and that's red blood cells. It's the primary component in our blood. That's a solid component. In addition, there's some white blood cells that help to fight infection, and then if we keep going here, we see some yellow fragments. Those are blood cell fragments called platelets. They help to stop uh, bleeding when you've gotten cut or injured. And after that, we're going to see a ton of other things. These little triangles here, they can simulate perhaps um, glucose or nutrients in the blood. And these white circles can represent oxygen atoms that are going to be delivered to your body cells. The, the blue circles, that can be CO2. It's the waste that your body cells produced. And then there are tons of hormones, such as thyroxine and adrenaline or testosterone that get circulated through the, the blood system. Uh, and there's still more. There could be nitrogenous waste, such as urea, that go to the kidneys to form urine. There's water droplets, because our water blood is not solids, it's some liquids as well. There could be solutes, just sodium, potassium, and calcium that all need to be circulated inside of our blood. So let's take a look at this flow chart here to kind of give you some, a frame of reference of where we're headed. We're going to first look at hematopoiesis, which is blood formation, and then look at the components of blood. We'll start with the liquids, such as plasma, and move then over to the solids, which includes the three, two types of blood cells, red and white, in addition to the blood fragments, the platelets. So without further ado, hematopoiesis. There are two types of tissues in our body that form blood cells. The first is myeloid tissue. This is in the red bone marrow, and it pretty much makes all different types of blood cells. You can see from this picture that not only does it make red blood cells, but it makes a plethora of white blood cells and the blood fragments, the platelets. Then a more specific type of tissue called lymphatic tissue found in our thymus, spleen, and lymph nodes are all over our body help to produce some of the more um, specific types of white blood cells. Now let's move on to blood composition. As I had mentioned earlier on the flow chart, plasma which is your liquid portion of blood, makes up over half, and the formed elements are known as the blood solids, which makes up just under half. 
Now if you look at the test tube on the right, you can see that breakdown. Plasma is at 55% and the solids at 45. Now if we just look at the plasma, we can break it down into three main components. Obviously since it's liquid, it's going to be made of water, but it will also include proteins and finally some solutes like sodium and potassium. Of the formed elements, the majority of them are the red blood cells called the erythrocytes. In fact, they make up um, almost all of that 45% of, of formed elements. And from there we have our thrombocytes, the platelets, and lastly the smallest chunk of formed elements are the white blood cells or the leukocytes. Let's just zoom in more specifically on the blood plasma and the protein portion. Now there are two main types of proteins that are found in the plasma that you will actually donate if you donate plasma. And the first are called albumins. And they really just help to keep the blood somewhat thickened and viscous so it's not too um, runny and dilute. The second type of protein it's called a globulin, and there are two types of globulins. The first are proteins that get converted into antibodies, and those help to fight off foreign invaders and viruses. And the second are a series of different proteins called clotting factors. Now, for some reason, if you need to receive blood plasma, but you do not need those clotting factors, and sometimes they don't want those clotting factors, to be honest, if we can get rid of those clotting factors through centrifuging, um, what's left is a few proteins and the blood plasma, and we don't call it plasma anymore, we call it serum. Now, back to our flowchart. We've done the hematopoiesis, we've looked at liquids, now we're just going to focus in uh, on the formed elements. So we'll start with the smallest component of the solids, the leukocytes. And from the diagram here, you can see there's two main categories. There's agranular and granular. Granular um, have little granules and agranule don't. Uh, but there are two types of agranular. And the first are the lymphocytes, which include, sorry, we'll do uh, monocytes first. Those are like little Pac-Man. And they go around munching up foreign invaders by a process known as phagocytosis. So go and just envelop them and digest them with lysosomes. The other type are lymphocytes. And those are the ones you maybe have heard of before. The T cell, B cell, the natural killer cell. Those are the ones that will produce antibodies in order to fight off primarily those viral infected infections. Um, the other hand of the spectrum, the granular proteins, or granular white blood cells. I always remember these because they have the prefix or suffix of fill. So they're filled with granules. The basophils produce histamine. If you remember from our inflammation topic, that's what gets the inflammation pathway started. The eosinophils are for allergic reactions. And then the neutrophils, you can see they are the most numerous of any white blood cell. They kind of do the same thing as the monocytes. They're the munchers of all the foreign invaders in our body. So that's a look at the white blood cells. Now on to the erythrocytes, the primary component of the formed elements. Um, they live about four months or 120 days. They look like little spaghettios because they're that biconcave shape. And they actually don't even have a nucleus. So their main goal is to deliver oxygen from our lungs to all of our body cells and pick up CO2 and drop that off at the lungs to exhale. Now, they really can't do that without the help of a protein inside of them called hemoglobin. And hemoglobin is the one that has an affinity or attraction to those two gases. It really does the work of the red blood cells. But hemoglobin itself can't do its work unless it has iron attached to it. And so um, it's the iron that really helps to pull in the oxygen and the CO2. So for example, if you are anemic, oftentimes your iron count is too low. And that's so then you can't carry oxygen, you may get very lethargic. So those who are anemic, they often take iron supplements to get their iron counts up. They can get more oxygen carried to their muscles and their body cells and get that energy level where it needs to be.
Now the last formed element are the platelets, the thrombocytes, and uh, they're obviously needed to clot blood. And what I'm going to show you is the actual positive um, feedback mechanism that your body undergoes to stop bleeding, whether in this case I'm going to show you an external cut and how your body stops that. So first off, platelets are going to be at that site because they're circulating in blood and they're going to release platelet factors. It's a very general term uh, for a series of different chemicals that will start this reaction from ha to happen. And now what's going to happen is that we have to activate a certain molecule. And that certain molecule needs both platelet factors and calcium to be activated, and that's prothrombin. It's always in our blood, it's just usually in this inactive form called prothrombin. But when we get those platelet factors and calcium attached to prothrombin, it activates into a molecule called thrombin. Now, we're not quite there yet. We haven't formed a blood clot to stop the bleeding yet. There's a few other events that have to occur. Now, thrombin is activated, and it's going to ha it has one main purpose as well. And that purpose is to activate another molecule known as fibrinogen. Fibrinogen is always in our blood, but just like prothrombin, it's usually inactive. So when thrombin binds to fibrinogen, because it's activated, it is then going to convert fibrinogen into the last product called fibrin. And fibrin is kind of, it looks exactly like what it does. It forms this fibrous net, which is going to trap blood cells and start to form a blood clot. And that blood clot will then eventually harden to form a scab. Now, this isn't quite the whole picture yet. How do we actually get this prothrombin produced? Well, it's synthesized from vitamin K in our livers. So if we're low on vitamin K, we're going to have trouble creating this blood clotting cascade. Without vitamin K, we can't make prothrombin, and then we can't get that activated into thrombin, and thrombin cannot activate fibrinogen into fibrin. So we're almost finished here. I just want to recap everything that we mentioned. We talked about hematopoiesis and the two types of blood tissues that make our, our blood cells. We looked at the components, the liquid components of, of blood at 55%, and all of the formed elements make up about 45%. And so I hope you found that helpful.